Hey everybody, Dylan Bowman here, one of the founders of Free Trail and the host of the Free Trail podcast. Thank you for watching our video podcast. A couple of things before we get started. Number one, please do join Free Trail Pro, our great community for trail runners from around the world. There's a lot of great perks involved in that membership and we would love to have you on board. Number two, a big thank you to our sponsors here in the video podcast. We don't do real commercial breaks, so I just wanna give them a major shout out on the front end here. We have some discount codes in the show notes that you can take advantage of. Number one, Speedland, of course, the makers of the GS Tam, the shoe that bears the Free Trail logo on it and a product that we worked on to bring to market in the spring of 2023. Our other annual partner is Gnarly Nutrition, makers of fantastic training and racing nutritional supplements that will really help you on your trail journey. We always have a third partner on the show that rotates throughout the year. So depending on who it is now, you can find a link and a discount code in the show notes for that partner as well. But a big thank you to the sponsors who do make our podcast possible. Number three, last but not least, we would really appreciate it while you're here to smash the subscribe button on the free trail YouTube channel. You can also click the bell icon to get notifications whenever we post new content. We are working very hard to keep you inspired, informed, and entertained here in the great sport of trail running. Thank you so much. Enjoy the show. John Kelly, you American hero. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks very much. Happy to be here. Yeah, in our email exchange, you were saying that you felt as if you had been hit by an SUV this morning, less like a freight train, which was actually a positive indication of your physical and emotional state. So maybe to start with a cliche question, how are you feeling and, and what's the feeling like a couple of days removed from your second finish at the Barkley Marathons? It's it's pretty good. Uh, so yeah, I've, I've had a couple of nights of decent sleep now. So I'm uh, losing the brain fog a bit. That, that's always the the toughest thing to recover from, more so than the the legs or any of the the physical parts. Is the the intellectual fatigue or the brain power fatigue from sixty hours trudging through the wilderness? <laughs> well, let's uh, let's get to that in a sec. One thing I actually would love to do to open the conversation is for you to introduce us all to Keith Dunn, <laughs> because for thousands of us all over the world, the Barkley is filtered through his Twitter feed, and he's a little bit of a mystery beyond that. So maybe enlighten the audience about Keith and what role he plays at the event. Uh, so Keith's been there for longer than I have. Uh, he's he's a, a part of uh, what kind of created the Barkley and uh, initially started tweeting about it. I think back when Twitter first started, it was really the first kind of outlet of any sort from there. Uh, before that, there would just be the the kind of post race write up uh, that Laz will put out, and, and that'd be it. So he he's an incredibly uh, nice guy, thoughtful guy, uh, but also uh, like Laz and many of the others involved, a, a bit devious, and you have to you have to be careful uh, reading too directly into into anything that he says. Yeah, because some of it is sort of intentionally vague, it feels like, in order to protect the sanctity of Barkley and the mystery inherent in the event. Yeah, so there's there's a number of, of kind of uh, unwritten, I'll say, understandings uh, rather than rules. And so one of them going way back is that uh, people wouldn't be outed that they're in the event. Uh, by anyone other than themselves until they they finish a loop and get added to the official results and and the the reasoning behind that basically was people could show up they could have a disastrous failure and uh, not have to tell anyone about it w wouldn't have to, to suffer the embarrassment if I, I went to Barkley and I didn't even finish a single loop yeah it was sort of like understated guy and bearded guy and Things yeah, like I that. saw that. That that was a new one. I think I was the other guy uh, yeah, this year. Yeah, yeah. Was fantastic. Well, I mean, speaking on behalf of thousands of Barkley fans, thank you to Keith Dunn for his highly entertaining and informative coverage of the race. And before we get too far into the Barkley weeds, I'd love to begin by talking about your education and and professional life. You have a PhD from Carnegie Mellon, and I think you work in data science and machine learning. Can you talk us through 
who you are and what you do outside of running, because I have a feeling that, that may guide much of the rest of our conversation. Yeah. And, and if you look at a lot of, of Barkley finishers, uh, they, they share that in terms of having uh, being in kind of the science and engineering, the research uh, background is it, it's really a, a complex puzzle uh, to solve. And so what I do for work is I take enormous amounts of data uh, currently on the risk of companies suffering a, a cyber attack. And I try to find signals in that that kind of predict what's the likelihood that something's going to happen, how much is it going to cost, what can we do to prevent it or or to mitigate it. And so it, it really is just a, a matter of, of pouring through this, this massive amount of information to try to, to find actual useful bits and pieces of it here and there. So just out of personal curiosity, your guys' company specializes in protecting the data or ensuring that other companies are protected against cyber attack. Is that right? Yeah. So we we model the risk uh, of, of companies for pricing cyber insurance. So if, if a company says, I want insurance against suffering a cyber attack, uh, we would look at them, we would assess them and say, okay, here's here's how much that's going to cost. Here's what your limits and all of that are. And it's your job to build that model. Is that how I'm interpreting it? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I built our, our original model. The, the team has fortunately grown past that point uh, to, to where we've, we've been able to distribute and, and delegate that a, a bit more. Amazing. So just going one level deeper, I recalled you posted uh, maybe a year or a little more than a year ago about your company closing a major funding round. And I went back and found the post because I recalled it being very interesting. And I uh, want to have, I'm going to just read a quick excerpt and ask you to expand on it. And what you said is, the journey has been a lot like an ultra, constant swings between euphoric highs and soul-crushing lows, luck and good fortune right alongside unforeseen obstacles and painful missed opportunities, and an unending resolve to continue moving one step ahead towards the goal. The two aspects of my life have very much fed off one another. Of course, the other aspect being your endurance life. So maybe expand on that and provide any other commentary about the parallels between early stage entrepreneurship and the Barkley marathons. Yeah. And, and that one, um, you know, that, that was a huge moment for us. It's also relating to, to ultras and mountain running, possibly a, a bit of a, a false summit and that we still have a ways to go, uh, before we can, uh, really achieve our, our goals on that. If I had to relate it to Barkley, that was, that was maybe loop four. Maybe I'm out on loop five now. Uh, the, the goals within sight, but things could still uh, come crashing down horribly wrong. And so, in both cases, though, it really is just a matter of you. You have this huge, long-term, seemingly infeasible, impractical goal. I mean, the things I do, Barkley, the Wainwrights, the Nine Way, any of those. If I start, stand at the start, and think. Oh, I have to spend the next 60 hours uh, running 130 miles through the woods with 75 feet or 70,000 feet of ascent. Uh, as a whole, it just it, it seems nuts. Uh, mm -hmm. and no, no one's no one's going to do that. It's it's difficult to even grasp, much less believe that it's possible. And so it, it's a matter of being able to to break it down into these manageable chunks and these manageable components and just keep moving forward and there's there's setbacks there's rewards there's really really tough low points um where it just seems like you should quit and and head back uh but it it does get better uh, and most most times it does keep trending up and, and eventually uh we'll we'll get there yeah how did the two pieces of your life fit together? I mean, obviously there is just this massive parallel. Does your experience as an endurance athlete translate into the low moments and the endurance that you need in order to navigate things in your professional life that aren't ideal? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's absolutely worked both ways. Uh, mm -hmm. There's been lessons from uh, my career that, that I've applied to to running and and vice versa. There's, been a number of particularly difficult 
points uh, early on where, you, you know, that modeling aspect of our business, that that was me, that the tech team was me. That's that's it. And so, uh, it, you know, there was in particular a, a month in, in December one year where is like when most of our business happens and it was just constant at the grind the the entire time and and i remember just thinking to myself you know if you can finish barkley you can get through this you can make it through this it's going to be good once you're done and and again we've we've now grown to the point where i'm i'm no longer the single critical thread that that everything depends on so i'm able to go out and do something like run barkley and while i'm out there not worry about like what's what's happening yeah. am i missing something that uh is is dependent on me while i'm out there and maybe that's part of the reason why you finished again is there was a little pressure relieved on the professional side of things and you were back in a place where you had the spiritual and emotional energy to get through five laps so let's talk about that in a sec but well I'd love I, to, go I, ahead. i'll just just add one thing to there that it's it's been i mean as tough as it's been on on both ends it's also uh, been very complimentary in, in terms of having the flexibility of just being in control of my own work schedule. There might be a massive amount of work, but I can kind of decide when it is and I can fit my run in or I can fit my race in or I can travel and work remotely. And uh, without that, there's, I don't think there's any way <laughs> that, that I could have gone on so many of the adventures I have the past yeah. few years. Well, maybe we should just get to this now because I put out a little call for questions on the internet and by far the most popular question was, how do you balance everything? Obviously, we've been talking about a very involved career. We haven't mentioned that you're also a father of four, I think it is. So maybe uh, satisfy the curious minds of the Free Trail podcast listeners who are desperate to know you know, how a father of four and somebody who does have such an involved professional career is able to also balance these amazing endurance feats as well. That has been a, a lot of learning and growth and improvement uh, as my family has grown. If I look back at how I trained for my first Barkley, uh, when our first child had just arrived, if I think of doing that now, it, no, like absolutely no way, not possible. Uh, the biggest change that I made early on was run commuting. And I know that's not something possible for everyone, but all of my weekday miles were to and from the office. Uh, that's it. So I was taking time. Otherwise, I would have been wasting in a car or on a train and getting my run in. Uh, weekends, I've my longer stuff, I've, I've tried to make family adventures out of it. You know, I'll get up early. I'll run to this destination like the zoo or something. Y'all meet me there and, and we'll have a day out. Uh, the races themselves, trying to make it a a family event, make them a part of it. Um, my wife's buy-in and and having communication and understanding there uh, has just been absolutely enormous. She's been a uh, huge support uh, that I couldn't do any of this without and just communicating as much ahead of time uh, as, as I possibly can of here's what I think of, I'm thinking about doing. Uh, would you be okay with that? Or how could we make this work? And if not, then then we'll find something else. Um, but it's it's still a, a constant process of, of getting better. And even now, with this added flexibility I have of working remotely, I'm I'm probably going to, for example, move my long runs from Saturday uh, to someday during the week when the kids are at school because I, in my training for Barkley, I was out on a couple of those long Saturdays just thinking like. I'd, I'd rather have taken the kids for a hike today. Yeah. And and so I'm, I'm going to see if I can make that work. Yeah. And then maybe work late at night on a Thursday or something like that. Yeah. Or, work and run when they're in school or asleep. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank goodness for moms and, and wives and partners and the people who make things possible. That really is the only way for there to be any semblance of balance. But yeah, I think uh, you are a great example of being able to piece um, several things together at a super high level, being a high achiever across all these different domains. It's super inspiring. Going back to the uh, profile of... Well, uh, just one more thing to, to add there. <laughs> I, I, 
also don't want people to think in ultra running that, that you have to, I mean, there are people out there, Jim and Courtney put in insane amount of miles Yeah, and, and that's, that's fantastic. Not all of us can do that. And so like you, you look at my Strava, I put in like what a serious recreational marathon runner does on, yeah. on any given week. And so it's, it's possible. It might not be optimal, but it's possible to get out and do these sorts of things with, yeah. with a reasonable schedule. Yeah. A hundred percent. So going back to the profile of Barkley finishers, having academic backgrounds and postgraduate degrees, <laughs> Can you describe the intellectual exercise in a way that is understandable for those of us who don't have those types of degrees? Like in what way do you apply some of the intellectual power that you have and the PhD, um, you know, work ethic that you have to something like the Barclay? Like how much of it is an intellectual puzzle? So there's, there's a lot of variables uh, involved. And so for me, it, it's always about planning for, for what I, I know I can do, uh, preparing for, for what I think might happen, uh, whether it be the weather or, or anything else that, that can change a bit, uh, and then proceeding, just, just getting on with it, uh, not wasting my energy on some of the things I have zero control over, like when is class going to start the race? I, I never give that a thought. I wake up and I start it when he starts it. But each of these things, it might seem like some of them are kind of inconsequential and they don't matter. But over a race that long, every little thing adds up. Uh, how long you take between loops, how long you take getting each page out of the book, uh, whether you're able to eat and change kit uh, while you're moving rather than stopping each time to get it out of your pack and, and do that. The first time that I finished, um, and actually, no, I'm going to use Carl as the example. Now, Carl finished with under seven minutes left. That is under seven seconds per hour of the race. If he had taken seven more seconds every hour, he wouldn't have finished. And so that's that's a lot of little things that, that are adding up. And so you have to be able to think about those little things and you have to be able to quickly react when something doesn't go your way, when you go off course or when the weather isn't what you thought it was going to be. You have to you have to have that contingency plan in your head and you have to go with it. You can't sit around thinking, what do I do now? Yeah. So you entered a proud fraternity of three people who now have more than one finish. Brett Mon, who I think is a physicist, Jared Campbell, who has three finishes. And I think he's a postgraduate degree in some kind of engineering yourself, a PhD computer scientist. Are there other examples of people from the race? I don't know much about Carl or Aurelian, the two co-finishers from this uh year. I don't know much about Aurelian professionally. Carl is a dentist. Um, John Fegavresi, who has crewed for me now both years that I finished, uh, he is a, a PhD researcher and does ice core research uh, in Antarctica and is a professor now. Uh, Blake Wood uh, is uh, <laughs> a, an incredibly smart guy, I think working at Los Alamos. Uh, so yeah, a, a lot of the, there's two main things in common. If you just kind of do a statistical break, grit, that break down is, is the, the advanced degrees, but then also having some sort of backpacking long distance FKT type, mm -hmm. type background. Uh, so, you know, D David Horton, Carl Saba, uh, Andrew Thompson, three people all set the uh, FKT on the Appalachian Trail, a yeah. uh, number of other big ones in there. So I, I think those are the, the two most common pieces of background. Yeah. And I think uh, Brett Mon used to have the FKT on the John Muir Trail. So yeah, <laughs> all the yeah. science. And, and, and pe people didn't believe him when he initially did right. it. And then he finished Barkley and they're like, oh, okay, I guess he's legit. Yeah. <laughs> It's so cool. And it's such like an interesting subtext of every race of just like how much of it is 
a psychological intellectual exercise as much as it is obviously the most overwhelming physical challenge perhaps on planet earth. So just to set the table for the audience, I know you've spoken about this in other places, but maybe explain the personal significance of the Barkley, given your upbringing in the area. What relationship do you have with Frozen Head? And when did the event ultimately land on your radar? Uh, so I grew up there right next to the course. Uh, my family's been there for 200 years now in this middle of nowhere backwoods community um and so it had it immense meaning to me to to be able to to go there the first time to to represent the community to uh explore m- those mountains and places that i hadn't been myself before um so it, that was just a, a wonderful feeling for me to to be able to do and now that has kind of evolved to the point that each year, I just feel like I'm I'm welcoming my friends over for for a party. It's uh, get to show them around and uh, show them an area I'm I'm proud of, and it's just um, truly unique for me in terms of the events out there. Yeah. So the feeling of having your friends over, part of Barclay tradition, I think, is learning from those who've come before you. And I'm sure you have sort of become a mentor to a lot of the newer runners. Your friend Damian Hall was over this year and had a fantastic debut on the Barkley course. And so you're sort of acting as an elder statesman in some ways. Who was that person for you? Was there anybody you shadowed in your early days at Barkley who acted as a mentor? So my my first race in 2015, I, I ran a, a lap with... Uh, Bev and, and Alan Abs, who uh, two historical uh, it, historically have done great things at Barclay. Bev was the last uh, woman fun run finisher for about a decade until Jasmine did it this past year. And so that got me started. Um, and then my second two loops that year were, were with Jamil Curry. And so that was uh, really my biggest introduction was was following him around and learning the course from that. And that was huge. Without that, I was still pretty early on in, in ultra running myself at that point. Uh, Barkley hadn't exploded to the popularity that it is now. Documentary hadn't come out. Again, I was the local boy, so I was honestly able to get in with less credentials given all that than than what most people have now. Uh, and without that support, it's it's likely that I I wouldn't have had a second attempt or a third, or, or anything beyond that. It would have been one and done, and, and probably uh, not much for my ultra running career beyond that as well. So it's just, it's huge to have that sort of support and, and mentorship uh, coming in. Yeah. You mentioned the documentary, and Barkley really has become a bit of phenomenon. Like it really does take over the internet to a degree you probably don't appreciate because you're out suffering on the course, but it's it's such a fascinating, riveting couple of days in the ultra running Twitter sphere. And I'm sure there's a tension there, of course, like protecting what makes Barkley, Barkley so special while also welcoming a greater community into the experience of the race. Do you have any commentary about that? You know, and especially like this week, there was a New York times article written about the race. And so I'm sure there's a tough balance to achieve there, which doesn't fall on your shoulders. It probably falls more to people like Laz, but I wonder if you have any comments on it. Yeah, I think it it falls on all our shoulders a bit. Uh, It's it's definitely a fine line, and it's something that I think there's tremendous value in sharing the stories of people out there and showing these uh, stories of perseverance, of people reaching uh, for their limits, of not being afraid of failure and uh, achieving great things and and doing so. Uh, Also, an appreciation for the wild places that, that we still have, all of that I, th- I think is, is incredibly valuable to to share um, publicly. But it, if we're not careful, you know, one of the documentaries was called "The Race That Eats Its Young." If we're not careful, it'll be the race that eats itself. 
uh, those those wild places will disappear. Uh, they'll be overrun. The experiences that runners are able to have out there uh, with solitude and and with these individual personal challenges, those will disappear. Uh, much of Barclay takes place. I mean, the big issue with it is that it is in this relatively small state park uh, where it is against the rules to go off trail uh, for everything except for Barkley once a year. There are some sensitive ecological areas. Uh, the race was nearly shut down 20 something years ago uh, and, and came back with an agreement that, you know, here's the number of loops that are allowed per year. Mm. And so if, if we're not careful and kind of being good custodians of that land, um, then, then it's something that, that won't be able to continue. So maybe this is a good time to talk about Laz in the same way we opened with a comment about Keith. I've never met Laz myself, but I find him to be, again, just a fascinating figure in the sport and just an immensely creative mind. Do you have any stories or anecdotes from your interactions with Laz over the years that have stood out or that you think the audience would find entertaining? Uh, I might have to take a second to, to think of a, a specific anecdote, but he is a very en enigmatic person uh, on, on the outside. Uh, he appears to be a tough, you know, badass coach type of person uh, on, on the inside. He, he cares nothing more about seeing people succeed and about uh, wanting people to have these opportunities to, to do great things. Uh, and so, you know, when when he says things like, oh, the woman will never finish, uh, that's that's his way of, of challenging exactly the type of women who can finish, who can say, no, F you, I'm, I'm going to do this. Um, and, uh, you know, that that approach rubs a lot of people the wrong way. He says a lot of things that uh, become a, a bit controversial. Uh and so, you know, he, he's he's no nonsense. He, he doesn't try to really cater to anyone's opinion. Um, but I, I think that for what he does in terms of helping people truly find what they're capable of, uh, he's he's highly effective and, and deep down a, a very uh, caring and, and understanding soul. Wow. Yeah. Again, I don't know him personally, but from the interviews that I've read. And of course I've seen all the documentaries that everybody else has watched. There does seem to be a genuine goodness that shines through there. And that makes him kind of the perfect person to have brought this race into the world and to continue stewarding it. So I want to talk about, well, first of all, <laughs> why well, maybe sticking on labs for a second? Is it true that as a returning finisher that you have to bring him a pack of cigarettes? Yeah. Um, so he he should have gotten three this year. He could have had one for each day. Uh, me and, and Jared and, and Nicodemus De La Rosa were were all out there. So yeah. it, it's um, Last year, I had to do that. I was still living in the UK, and I, I went to the local grocery store to to get my my pack of cigarettes, and and they card me, and and so here I am in in middle of nowhere, Tennessee, clearly not with a British accent, and I get carded for cigarettes, and I'm pulling out a UK driver's license, and I'm like, this is this is a bit suspicious, um, but fortunately, I was I was able to get my entry fee and make it into the race. It's so, so funny. And that's exactly where I was going with Nicodemus, who finished in 2013, Jared Campbell, who again, three time finisher, 2012, 2014, 2016. And it makes me want to ask, like, to what extent previous experience and previous finishes are an advantage? Like, what about the course stays the same and what changes year to year? Uh, sometimes not much. Uh, and, and sometimes quite a bit. And so it really depends on whether your experience is um, before or after that, uh, what one of those big changes. Uh, prior experience is always going to help some. There are some pieces of the course that, as far as I know, they've they've always been there. 
more um, pieces that they really don't change very often. But for example, in so three people finished in 2012. That was the year of the documentary. Uh, Jared, Brett, and John, and then uh, the the next year Nicodemus and Travis. So five people, two years. The year after that, he made a change to the course that that Jared estimated added about 40 minutes per loop. Uh, and until this year, that that was a decade where only Jared and I had finished. And so those types of changes, I, I think, if you're if you don't know that they're there, um, can can really mentally break you if if you come in accept, expecting one thing, and then it's even more than that. Uh, and and in general, I think that's what gets a lot of great runners to begin with when they head to Tennessee and think, oh, it's just Tennessee. The mountains aren't that big; it'll be fine. Well, that's what I'm getting at is that it's like it's not obvious why the race is so hard. And when I've never really spent much time in that area or in the South in general, but I associate it more with like warmer, humid weather. And then every year it's like just heinous conditions and everybody's wearing free jackets and tights and winter hats and a trash bag in your case. So um, maybe that's a, another thing that you could shine a light on. Like, in what ways is this race so freaking impossible? I'm sure it's really hard to articulate, but anything that you can add without betraying these secrets of the race or these understandings, as you called them, I'm sure there's many people who would love to hear. So, I mean, the the terrain is is rough and, and steep, and there are places all over the, the East coast where, yeah, you can find some steep Hills. They may not be very long. Um, but frozen head in particular, if you, if you just look at it on a topo map, you're kind of like, what, how did that get there? Like, what is that? It sticks up in a way that just doesn't seem natural. And so you're constantly going up and down these, these steep, you know, 40% grades and, uh, that, that's the biggest part uh, in, in terms of the difficulty. Also, the footing on those, it's covered in leaves, rocks, mud, roots. Um, that That's an added degree, and you're running through briars and, and mountain laurel bushes uh, at the same time. So you've, you've really got to kind of uh, let your foot off the brakes sometimes when mentally you don't want to in, in terms of seeing the terrain in front of you. The weather is another huge thing. Uh, this year was the best Barkley weather I've seen. It got a bit cold at night, um, but there was there was no precipitation. The ground was relatively dry. Uh, wasn't really windy. Uh, it was it was great. And but typically that time of year in East Tennessee and in, in March, having three straight days of good weather is is unheard of. Mm. And so. It's not necessarily the how extreme the weather gets. It's how volatile it gets. Where, you know, I remember what actually was that year with Jamil, where there was a night where we were on top of uh, Frozen Head, where there's a water drop. And these are gallon jugs of water that were frozen solid. Not like, oh, there's a little chunk of ice here or they're slushy. Solid blocks of ice could not get anything out whatsoever. The next afternoon, like 12 hours later on that exact same climb, I am in shorts and a t-shirt baking, just sweating to death. Mm. And so, you know, the body's good at preparing for and training for one extreme or the other, but that constant back and forth, uh, it, it, it wears you down. Incredible. So you finished in 2017 and then there was no finishes until this year. What do you attribute that six-year drought to? Acknowledging, of course, that 2020 was canceled due to COVID. Yeah. Uh, well, I do think that for a few years, he might have swung a bit too far in the difficulty direction. Uh, I'm not going to say that the course was unfinishable, but it was certainly more difficult than this year's course was. Um. And so that's that's a very difficult thing to do in terms of 
keeping a course right at the edge of what's possible. You know, anyone can make a course that's impossible. That's that's not hard. Um, but it Barkley over the years, it, it's really an arms race between uh, Laz and the runners. You know, you get LED headlamps instead of these old carbide ma- mining la- lamps. Okay, I'm going to add this section. Now you have trekking poles. I'm going to add this. Now you have running packs and running shoes. And now you actually know how to train for these things. Like all of these improvements that that we make, even things like Everyone used to go back to their car between loops and and have a nice transition. I really started in 2017 the whole, uh, no, I'm just going to sit down at the gate and get back out in under 10 minutes. And now now everyone does that. Everyone who wants to finish has to do that because, you know, that became an option. When I said, okay, if you're going to do that, I'm going to add this section to the course. Yeah. And and so it's it's this constant back and forth of, of trying to outwit the other one but at the same time keeping it right at that edge where it it is possible um just extremely difficult right and it feels like laz has a bit of that science-oriented brain in him too and that he is able to keep it close to that edge even though there was a six-year drought i mean with three finishers this year Aurelian finished in 58 hours and 20 minutes. So what did he, he had a hundred minutes to spare. You had slightly less than that. And Carl, like you said, it was seven seconds a lap. And so Laz is probably doing math problems in his head too, about how to keep it as close to that margin as possible to make it possible, but unlikely for almost anybody. Yeah. And I think there's, there's a perception that he'll probably make it much more difficult next year. I don't necessarily know that that's true um, because I mean, like you said, there's, there's me and and Aurelian who had over an hour left, say an average of an hour and a half, but again, the the weather and the start time. Uh, We, we had a very good start time this year. Uh, Rat jaw was mowed, the the infamous slope that has all the briars on it uh, that they had mowed that. Last year, it wasn't. And so, you know, you were going down that just like pushing your way through these curtains of briars. Uh, And so I think that next year might be slightly more difficult, but with the expectation that the conditions are more normal Mm -hmm. because you you don't want to make it to where it has to have absolute perfect bluebird conditions in order for anyone to finish. Yeah. Interesting. I want to talk about your mental outlook a little bit. I went back and read your 2017 report from the year that you finished. And you'd mentioned that in 2015, you were genuinely scared of the race and you failed that year. In 2016, you said you were more confident, but you were anxious. And then in 2017, you were genuinely excited about the race. And that struck me as a fairly profound data point there. Can you talk about the mental outlook from 2017 and maybe how it was similar this year where you got another successful finish? Yeah, I, I've I've kind of evolved past that. And I actually, I drew out a chart at one point of, of kind of my, my focus and, and determination levels for Barkley that early on, I just, I way overshot. I was, it was all consuming, you, you know, I just, I got in that first year and I didn't know what I was doing. Like I was surprised to get in. I got my condolence letter and it was essentially like, oh, what do I do? I there's a hill. I guess I'll go run up and down that hill. There's another one. I'll I'll go run some repeats on that hill. And so I, I went into it not knowing what I was doing, what to expect. I got that first year of experience. Uh continuing on to my finish though, I, I still had that kind of I want to finish this. I had this pressure, this, the stress that everything I'd put into it, I needed it to be, to result in a finish coming out of that. I I tried to do it two years later and I I got after two loops, I was in the lead and I just said, Nope, it's not worth it. Don't, don't, don't want to uh, do what I know that I'm going to have to do on loops four and five. So I'm done. Um, and then last year, it, it really just kind of I hit this equilibrium of like, I know what I'm doing. I'm confident. I don't have to freak out and 
do all this ridiculous training or all of this other prep. Like I, I have this body of knowledge and this base of experience built within me. And I very much have the motivation and the drive to finish. I'm, I'm going to do what it takes to get this done, but it doesn't have to consume my life. It doesn't have to destroy me with anxiety and I'm going to have fun and, and I'm going to uh, try to help other people along the way. And that was my attitude last year. I lost my pages. And so, you know, I just did a fun run. Uh, but then that carried on to this year. And again, it was just combine that attitude with the conditions that we had. And it was just a, it was a great time out there. I remember Gary Robbins saying something similar about how the race can just take over your entire life and your entire existence, particularly when he had that famous heartbreak in 2017, the year that you finished and where you had a front row seat to one of the most dramatic moments in endurance sport history, as far as I'm concerned. But like I said, I put out a call for questions on the internet. And this was another thing that came up a lot is just sort of like, why go back? Like, it's such a miserable experience, it seems like. And when you're already in that small, proud group of people who has a finish, what is it about Barkley that keeps you motivated? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a great question. And that's one that I've I've had to ask myself many times uh, over the years. And for me, uh, I mean, one, it's again, it's it's not miserable anymore. I can see where it is for people and where people have this perception that it's just some sort of masochistic event. But I I genuinely enjoy it. Of course, I have low points. Of course, there are points out there where I wonder what, what am I doing? Like, why am I doing this? Uh, but overall it's even mostly type one fun for me, uh, these days. And the big thing for me going into this one is I wanted to see if I'm still mentally capable of controlling myself enough to where I don't need that extra sort of reward that carrot on a stick of you know i'm going to become a finisher can i just do it because i want to do it and i I don't need anything else to to be driving me other than my own mind and willpower and if i can do that then i mean the confidence boost coming out of that is is huge because i i can do that for so many whether it's races or fkts or stuff at work uh i i know that I can do that and that I have that willpower. And beyond that, I, I continue learning everything or new things every year that, that I go back. And so uh, it's just those sorts of things I, I don't get out of, out of most other races that I do. And what a beautiful life lesson when you can be internally motivated and do Barkley for the joy of doing Barkley rather than, or the perceived pressure of being one of three multi-time finishers or something like that to actually go and have type one fun. That's when actually you have the energy open up internally to where you can actually get to the finish line. And I don't know, it feels like a, a fairly profound lesson from the conversation. So let's yeah, talk. And, go well, ahead. I just, just to quickly summarize that up in, in mindset, I, I'd say that early on before I had one finish, it was a, a fear of not finishing. That, that drove me. Whereas now it's the joy of finishing. That That is the, the drive. Wow. Beautiful. So let's talk about the race and I don't we'll need you to go through the entire 60 hour ordeal. Maybe we could break it into three chunks, like the first two laps, the second two laps and the final lap. And we can just sort of breeze through, you know, again, like whatever you think is interesting is sort of how I would like you to guide this part of the conversation. I think, you know, laps one and two, it it strikes me just as somebody who's just been a digital observer of the event for a decade, that it's really all about maintaining yourself and figuring out the course more or less finding the books etc and a lot of times people run together in that early part of the race can you just talk about the strategy you employ on the first two laps yeah it's it's very much a, a group effort uh that early on as in particular there's there's always two or three new book locations and 
Laz's directions are, are very good and the map is very good. It's it's not an orienteering event. You're generally, you know, go down this ridge and then follow this creek. It's not take a bearing of 105 degrees and cut 320 feet straight across the terrain. So the directions in the map get you in the vicinity of the book quite well. But then actually finding the book the first time can can be tricky. They're they're pretty well hidden. They have to be because otherwise the wild boar out there will eat the books. Um and, and so, you know, it it might be hidden underneath one of 20 rocks or have descriptions like there are two trees 20 feet apart when you're in the middle of a forest. And so having a group to kind of fan out and search that area to find the exact book location is is pretty huge. Um, also, just people at that point are, are trying to learn. And I'm I'm trying to share as I go along, you know, we'll get to a book and I'll, as I take off, kind of shout my reference points that I'm using for navigation and, and in, any other tips that I have. Uh, so, yeah, the, that part is is very much about learning. And uh, it, trying to to bank any time you can from good conditions. Uh, you, you know, when you're fresh, if the weather is good, you've you've got to make use of that to essentially make a deposit into your your time buffer, because you're you're going to need to use it later, uh, inevitably. So, is it once you've found all the books on lap one, is it generally easier to then find them again on ensuing laps or with the yeah. fatigue? Okay. Yeah. It, it's, you know, sometimes there will be a little bit of, of time to, to find one in particular because it's, it, you know, it, it's five loops, but each loop really seems a bit different because, you know, it's, it's clockwise daylight, clockwise night counterclockwise day counterclockwise night and then a fifth loop that you're just kind of it's it's a whole different world at that point so some of those changes yeah it might take you a minute or so but generally it's it's pretty straightforward so it seems like lap three is where things get real for a lot of people so much so that if you finish three laps you get the proud accomplishment of being a fun run finisher, which is a hilarious designation. How do things change and compound on lap three? What makes that the crux? Uh, so, I mean, obviously that's, that's kind of the, the halfway point, um, but it's where I think most people really start to feel fatigue, uh, both physical and mental fatigue. Uh, it's where you've gone through one night at that point. And I think that for everyone, uh, you can make it through one night of sleep deprivation, you can do okay with that, but it's going into the next evening uh, where, where things start to get tricky and you have to wonder, well, do I need to sleep? Can I get through this with caffeine? Or you can just start to make mental errors uh, because you're not fully alert and fully focused uh, every single second. So, you know, I would say that that loop three is is kind of if one and two are the intro and the learning, uh, loop three is where the, the race really starts. Uh, loop four is where it gets tough. And, and loop five is just hanging on. Yeah. You mentioned a second ago about your strategy in the camp. I would love for you to go a little deeper on that. Uh, Like, for example, I I read that you after I think it was after lap three, you spent like 20 minutes in camp. So maybe how what are you doing in those 20 minutes and how does that evolve throughout the race and any other tips and tricks or strategies that you've employed for those critical transitions? Uh, Basically, I am just changing any uh, gear that I need based on the, the upcoming weather. I'm trying to get some more uh, food down, some actual solid, hardier food that I may not take uh, on the loop with me. Uh, my, my crew, John Fagvaresi, was bringing me a lot of tots from Sonic. Uh, th- those were great. Um, so those those are the two main priorities. Uh, sometimes, like after loop two this year, where it got quite cold, uh, that night on loop two. Again, it was dry, so it was okay. Um, but the temperatures were 
down around 20, even in camp. So could have been single digits uh, up top. So at that point, uh, instead of setting down right at the um, right at the gate for a quick turnaround, we might go sit down in the bathhouse, which is nice and warm, because that's that's the worst thing to to happen to to stop for just a few minutes. Your core temperature drops. You're sitting there shivering. Uh, it, it makes it really hard to to get going again, uh, especially uh, wearing the the right gear. Uh, but generally, when, when I come in, I, I want to get fed. I want to get my clothes changed. Um, I want to stay warm. And I even have I, I have two packs so that my crew has my pack for the next loop ready to go. And I just swap it out, hand them the one I just used and uh, head out. Fantastic. So leaving camp after loop four, you were in the lead and you chose to go clockwise. Can you explain the significance of that detail for those who don't understand and why you did decided to go that direction? Yeah, that's, um, I thought that I had a, a pretty sizable lead um, as I was finishing up loop four and that I was going to be able to take a nap starting before starting loop five. Uh, but as I'm kind of going over the last little bump uh, of of the loop, I look up behind me and suddenly I see a headlamp coming down the switchbacks from the top of the mountain. I just think, oh crap! I, I, I don't I don't know if I'm going to be able to nap. Uh, and and so I, I get in, and sure enough, it's not long before a really comes in behind me. Um, early on in the race, I was honestly thinking, you know, if there's well, Aurelian and I hadn't hadn't run together at all. That's the funny thing. Like Aurelian and Carl and I are the three that finished and we didn't run together like at all. Uh, I was I was with Damien and Albert the whole time. And I was I was thinking early on that, you know, maybe I'll ask them which which direction they want and I'll take either. You know, I've done this before. Uh but at that point I was uh yeah, I, I won a clockwise and I'm I'm personally much more comfortable uh navigating that direction. Uh, there is one climb called the meat grinder that I wanted no part of going counterclockwise. Uh, and, and no one does really. Oh, you would um, be going down the meat grinder if you go. No, go, go, going up it. Okay. Um, so yeah, I wanted to be going down it. Wanted to, that's um, what I mean. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and then the third thing that was really just personal for me, and, and this was a bit of reasoning in 2017 as well, the, uh, if you're going clockwise, the final top, the final peak is Chimney Top. And this is a mountain that I hiked with my family uh, as a kid. I could look down on the climb and, and see my family's farm sitting down there. And in 2017, I had this vision that, you know, I'm going to finish and I'm going to have this big, glorious, triumphant moment going up this peak and rip my final page out and look down at my farm. And it was it was horrible. It was miserable. It was raining. It was foggy. I, I was sleep deprived and completely out of my mind. Uh, it was, it was just saying nothing like my vision. Uh, so I wanted another chance at that. And, and I got it this time. It was just, it was beautiful weather. I, I climbed chimney top at sunset and just enjoyed this beautiful sunset all the way up looking back seeing the farm down there, got to the top and, and sat there enjoying it, just counting my pages. Uh, and it was just, uh, yeah, I'm happy with that. So next time, maybe I'll, I'll give the other person the choice of uh, which way they want to go and I'll, I'll take my nap. It's a beautiful description. And it makes me just think those are the peak life experiences right there. Like that is a hundred percent something that'll stick with you forever. That that night alone on top of chimney top, looking down at the family farm, nobody else will ever understand it except for you. And what a beautiful thing that is. It, I just pulled up one of Keith's tweets because it, your description made me think about it. And you're kind of talking about how ultimately it did become a race. Obviously finishing Barkley alone is a massive accomplishment, but you guys actually were competing out there and 
what Keith said is John is limping, Aurelian is sprinting. In each of their minds, there is a halfway point in loop five and both want to reach that point first. We have a race. <laughs> so to what extent was the competitive drive alive in you at that point? And what is Keith talking about the halfway point on loop five? Um, I mean, if I were to be completely honest, not not much. Um, I was... I was entirely concerned about staying awake and, and getting myself to the finish on loop five. Uh, I did have a bit of a bum knee. I smacked it into a tree on one of the descents earlier. Um, just one of those things that like, it, you know, it hurts, but it's not going to get worse. It's, it's fine. Um, I think Aurelian was uh, a, a bit upset that I had taken the clockwise um, direction. And so I think he was sprinting out of camp and, and anger just a bit. Um, so I, I think he he very much did have that drive. Uh, and I mean, he, he earned that anyway. He ran an absolutely brilliant race um, from the outset in, in terms of pacing, in terms of learning the course in his first time out there. We unfortunately missed each other um, on kind of there, – there's a steep out and back, uh, just down and back up section that has a lot of undulation, a lot of growth on it. And so, you know, if, if if you take lines that are 15 feet, feet apart, you, you might miss one another. And so that's what happened. Um, but he saw Carl and then I saw Carl uh, as I was finishing that out and back just as Carl was starting it. Mm -hmm. So we, we kind of knew that we had just missed each other and we knew where we both were. Uh, but we, we didn't get to there see each interaction other. there that I, I would love to hear more about that. Like when you and Carl see each other, two zombies <laughs> wob wobbling around in the woods, knowing that both of you are on the precipice of potentially finishing the Barkley. Was there a attaboy or a good luck or was it just, Oh, absolutely. Uh, I was so pumped to see Carl there. Um, he's, you, you know, this was his third time. I ran with him for most of the race last year, and then he had his heartbreaking exit, uh, wandering into a nearby town and uh, getting lost and, and having to hitch a ride back to camp with the sheriff. Uh, so I was pumped to see him still on it because I'd, I'd been a bit concerned early on when he he had dropped back. Like I'd been running with Albert and Damien, and, and he dropped back a bit, and I was I was worried that he he wasn't feeling well or doing good, but he was just doing a great job of, of pacing himself. Um, so that that was exciting to see. And I did also know at that point that if I started to slip, uh, I, I would have Carl basically as a backstop behind me. That to it's easy in that mental state to kind of just lose it and think forget about the fact that oh, I have a race to finish. Whereas I knew that if I slipped into that a bit, I'd have Carl coming up behind me and snapping me back into it. So that was a great safety net to have. Wow. Fantastic. Maybe lingering on this a little while longer, just saying a few words about the two other guys that, that finished Aurelian his first time out there. Is that unusual to have a first time attempt? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Um, there's, there's a few people that have done it. Um, John Fegbaresi did it, uh, largely on, on his own, uh, which is in, incredibly impressive. Jared did it. He ran with Brett, uh, most of the time. I, I think everyone else that's done it, uh, has had someone like a veteran or a previous or another finisher to run with, uh, the, the entire time and, and to learn the course. And so Aurelian was, was with Guillaume and some other veterans for much of the race. Uh, but he was doing a lot of the, the later parts, loop four, loop five, those, those were on his own. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he did a, a tremendous job at that. And I just, I know how much he's worked for it, how much it, it meant to him, how, how much it went, meant to all of France. Like France is crazy about Barclay absolutely crazy about it. The most random place that I've ever been recognized in my life was in the Pantheon in Paris. This dude walks up to me. Are you John Kelly? <laughs> yeah. 
And, and so, you know, if, if you haven't seen it, go on Twitter and look at like the the welcome that Aurelian yes. got in the Toulouse airport getting home. They pop champagne and everything like you won the World Series. It's it's fantastic. Yeah. I was and, just going to mention that because I retweeted it basically right before we got on. I was just like scrolling through Keith's Twitter profile and he had somehow tracked down the welcome committee for uh, for uh, Aurelian when he arrived home in, in Toulouse. So it was an incredible accomplishment and so cool to see him, you know, receive that hero's welcome. And meanwhile, you go back to North Carolina and he can walk through <laughs> Any grocery store and nobody has any idea who you are, probably, huh? No, that's that's fine. Mm-hmm. Um, but but yeah, I, I mean, it's it's just it's fantastic for them, and it's fantastic for those communities to to have that inspiration and, and to have them to look to. Uh, Carl, likewise, uh, there was a, a video of a huge celebration when when he finished, uh, and it, it would have been heartbreaking to see. I was sitting there doing the math in my head, thinking, oh, well, he has 10 minutes left. We should be able to see his headlamp when he comes off the trail down there. It's going to take him like five minutes to get from that trail, you know, like thinking it was going to be another Gary situation that, that I was going to be sitting there for. And and so seeing him make that uh, was was just in, incredible. And, and thinking uh, again of, of just him snatching that opportunity of, of those great conditions, the great start time and and getting it done. And, and that is just uh, huge for him, uh, huge for, for that whole community uh, there that's, that's around Mount, Mount Saba as, as his, uh, his training hill got renamed a couple of years ago. Did it really? Wow. Yeah. The legendary Belgian dentist who is incredible long course person too i think yeah we had the pct fkt before Timothy. yeah and and yeah. still has the at still has the at that's right wow god you guys are just so incredible any other fun anecdotes of after the three of you finished any war stories exchanged that you think the audience would find entertaining uh we well we we went to uh our the pizza joint that i've gone to since like middle school after every race uh, Big Ed's, which is just fantastic place. Aurelian and uh, his support, Alex, were there with us, uh, which was hilarious because, you know, in, in France, I think the drinking age is like five and Alex and Aurelian show up and, and they get carded. And Alex is like, Alex has solid white hair, is like, no way anyone could ever think that he is he is under 21 but like they are strict they won't let him have it with a photo of his id they won't do anything so i'm like okay i'll get the beer and i'll get a water and i'll drink all the water and then i'll pour the beer into the water cup and there there you go and they're like they have freaking security cameras or something they show up five minutes later and it's like sir what's in that cup <laughs> no and it's like, do you have any it's, idea it's, what so, yeah i was like can we not just let the man have a beer come on baby his friend for the last 60 hours yeah. he needs some alcohol in this moment please so i uh yeah i had to, to apologize and assure them that that was was not the the normal thing but uh we we had a great meal uh great time catching up about the race wow. uh my my biggest i i just posted on it um it still blows my mind on, on loop five. I was really struggling with sleep, like struggling to stay awake. And a lot of people have hallucinations uh, when they get in that spot. I've I've never had a vivid hallucination, uh, which I feel like I'm missing out a bit uh, on that. But what happens to me is I just, I start stumbling and like I could fall asleep while I'm moving and just fall on my face and and be out. And so I was kind of getting, to that point and uh decided i needed to take a quick nap but laz gave me the cheap watch laz gave me the alarm didn't work on it so like i had no way of ensuring that i wasn't going to fall asleep for 10 hours and wake up after the race yeah, you can't i was take looking that yeah. Yeah, i was looking for miserable spots and i got to this water sp- with the water drop i saw these muddy tire tracks out there and i was like those are probably still cold from last night that's perfect so I, I walk over, I pour some water over myself, lie down, face down in these muddy tire tracks. And then I look up 
and my, a childhood friend walks by with his wife and kids. And I'm like, oh, hey, hey, Kit. And he says, oh, that's a John Kelly nap if I've ever seen one and just keeps walking. And like, I think I tried to mumble something about like, it's Barkley Loop 5. I need to sleep. Uh, and but like they just they just kept walking. And at the time I was like, OK, cool. That's, you know, they understand it's the race. But afterwards, I'm like. I mean, hey, what are the chances like he, he would I recognize him? Now. Like, wh- how would I recognize him? I haven't seen him in twenty years. And who who would just keep walking? Like, who would just be like, oh, that's normal, dude, face down in the mud in the woods. That's cool. And so I was convinced that I had had my first legit hallucination. Yeah. Uh, but I I messaged him. I found him this morning on on LinkedIn of, of all places, and, and messaged him the somewhat awkward. Uh, hey, did you see me laying in the tire tracks or the, the muddy tire tracks last week by chance? And he messaged back like, oh, yeah, that was us. It's like, are you kidding me? You're just going to let me lay there? Come on. Yeah, well, I mean, he, <laughs> oh, he knew the race. He understood the race. He, uh, you know, that's not the first time I've pulled something like that. And, and so it's great that he did, because otherwise he probably would have insisted on helping me off the mountain. My race would have been done. Uh, wouldn't have been good, but it's just, you know, what, what on earth what are the earth? odds of that? And the fact that I actually, again, my mind had enough acuity left in it to recognize him and just be like, Oh, Hey kid. And yeah. So I'm hoping we'll, I'll meet up with him and we'll, we'll go for a normal hike in the woods and, and catch up a bit. The universe brought you guys together in that moment for some yeah. reason. You guys got to go reconnect. I can't finish without having you say a few words about Jasmine's performance. Can you put that in context for the listeners? Jasmine has been phenomenal both years. Uh, she has been largely on her own uh, out there and navigating on her own, pushing herself on her own. She just put in the the greatest women's performance uh, ever. Uh, and, and this was on not having the best training, the best build coming into this. Uh, previously, only one other woman, Sue Johnston, had started Loop 4. Uh, Sue went out and got two books and, and came back. Um, Jasmine, I, I believe, got all of her books, but but was over the time limit. She got nine four. nine pages on loop four from okay. what I saw. Nine of okay. thirteen on loop four. So yeah, it's it's phenomenal. And I, I hope because to me she has she has the complete package and as far as the skill sets go that you need to finish. She has the speed, she has the navigation, she has the mental resilience. It's all there. And, and I, I want to see her come back and keep seeing what she can do. And as, as much as it's, you know, it's, it's tough to be out there on your own. I, I also personally know how beneficial it is. We're in, in my second attempt in 2016. Uh, I was on my own for the entire time and started my fifth loop. I uh, only made it to one book. Uh, but that, that experience was huge for me in, in future success. So I look forward to seeing not only what she can do with that experience, but what she can do if if she has a partner out, out there for that time as well. Yeah. Wow. Well, let's start winding down now, Jonathan. Thanks so much for the time. This is so, so fun. I'm not going to ask you if you're going to go back, but I'd love to hear if there's anything else that we we didn't cover about this year's race, anything that's on your mind now with a two fairly decent nights of sleep that you're thinking about in its aftermath that you'd like to share. I I think that that pretty well covered it. It's just you know it, it's amazing to me each year to to keep to get to keep going back. And I, I know when I'm out there, I'm getting to experience this. I'm I'm getting to learn all these things. I'm I'm getting to push myself in this unique format and and share it with these other people. But like it's it's, it's a tiny number of people uh, relative to. Uh, who all's out there uh, on Twitter and, and elsewhere watching. And so 
as we mentioned earlier, like I, I really want to be able to to share the lessons learned from this and and to be able to kind of have this be a, a shared experience uh, rather than just forty people that are permitted each year, and see how we can uh, take this to create other other things uh, that give people similar opportunities. Uh, whether it's doesn't have to be this same format race, but uh, just just things that that. A, appeal to people individually because you know it's it's definitely not your typical uh cookie cookie cutter race to to say the least and i think that there is a ton of diversity in our sport in terms of what people prefer doing and what they excel at doing uh so I, i'd love to to see what lessons we can take to to build on that and and to build opportunities for for people to have that same type of experience fantastic well, John, congratulations on your second finish. Thanks for coming on the podcast and sharing the story. It's riveting. It's so entertaining. So fun to follow. I hope you get some rest. Thanks so much.